Hello, I am uh, Jesse Weiler here for the Institute on Religious Life and Vocation Ministry, and I am here with Father uh, Wolfgang Seitz, and he is a, a priest of the Canons Regular of Holy Cross in uh, in Ohio. Father, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, and uh, I'm very excited to talk about our topic today. I'm very excited to to learn uh, about your vocation story. But before we get into any of that, would you mind leading us in prayer first? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And again, I'm very excited to hear about your story and, and hearing about uh, our, our topic for today, you know, participating in, in Christ's passion. Very excited about that. But, you know, we, we also like to hear the vocation story. So would you mind starting, um, you know, where, where did you hear your call to religious life? And what was that like for you? What was that experience like for you? Yeah, uh, I perceived my call relatively late. So I'm a uh, late vocation, I believe. And I grew up uh, in Germany in a very Catholic family especially my mother, she had a very profound, a very strong faith, even in great difficulties. And, and this marked me and the whole family. And, and I always want to become, uh, I did not want to become a priest, actually. I always want to get married as every man <laughs> wants to be, I think. Uh, uh, but I always wanted to direct my life totally towards God. Uh, and I was already um, dating, and my girlfriend at the time also uh, was very devoted. And so we part participated in pilgrimages and so on. And one time I was going to a shrine in Germany. It's called Marienfried. It's the peace of Mary. And that's where I then suddenly experienced the call to the priesthood. And for me, it was just a shock. I didn't expect it. I didn't want it. Uh, and I needed uh, uh, quite some time in order to adapt myself to this call and then to say for the yes. And then, um, you know, Germany, it's very difficult uh, to be a priest, I think, now with what everybody hears also in the news. It was already at that time. pretty uh, difficult and so I resisted first to follow uh, this call but then I participated in a pilgrimage that was led by the priest of the order of Kings regular of the Holy Cross and when I saw how they lived really the priesthood to the full but I always aspired to have a very high ideal of the priesthood so once I realized this, then I thought now it becomes a possibility for me to become a priest. And then uh, su successively, I learned more about the order. And then at one point, I entered the order with my postulancy in Austria and the, and the mother house. Then um, my novitiate in Portugal, because in Portugal, the order originated in 1131. And then for our studies, we have to go to Brazil to our own seminary that's in the uh, Diocese of Annapolis, that is central Brazil in the 
state of Goyas. So, and that's, I was there for six years for philosophy, uh, studied philosophy and theology, and then was ordained a priest in 2002. And uh, then I was transferred to, to the United States. And uh, since then I'm in the United States, serving as a priest in the order. Uh, that that is such a, an amazing story you know i love to hear those stories where there's an encounter and then there's some clarity and revelation about one's vocation but the one thing that you know trips me up a lot is how do you know how did you know that that encounter that you had at at that shrine was one of a vocation to the priesthood and not just one of, you know, just a general encounter with your faith and kind of like, a, you know, in a general thing, just to kind of renew and restore your faith. How did you know it was focused on your vocation? I never thought, not for even one moment, becoming a priest before. And uh, I don't want to go now into details, but um, it was. Um, during the mass, at one point, it was just crystal clear to me. Like it's not because I'm something special, you know. God always adapts Himself to the soul, and He probably thought He is so unbelieving. I do need to do something special for Him. So, so God, I think, did really something special for me. Not because I'm a great Christian, but because He knew. Uh, you know, I need it in order to be able to say yes. And uh, this experience helped me afterwards very much also to go through with the priesthood in my vocation because uh, to say yes at the first instant is not so difficult, but then to go through actually through all this, there are also nights, tests, trials you need to go through. Uh, but thinking back, on my vocation experience, uh, I always knew I have a vocation, and this really kept me to pursue my vocation to the end. Uh, and a big part was certainly also the Blessed Mother, because it was a shrine of Our Lady, and then all the different um, certain key events or key dates uh, were always related to uh, a day of the Blessed Mother or a place. Of the Blessed Mother, for example, was finally in Nazareth, where I could give my final yes to God's call. Uh, but uh, as I said, it's um, everybody has own equation stories. Some people they simply almost naturally because they have this example of a priest simply follow naturally. I want to become a priest. I don't have a special experience, but their vocation is as true as my vocation. But for me, it was necessary because um, there were some very rocky times and where normally somebody would say, now I quit. But this was always, uh, I, I would go on because I knew for sure 100% what had called me to, to the priesthood. As somebody, like you said, is a late vocation, I, I would imagine that it gets harder and harder to relinquish your lifestyle. Again, you know, somebody that you were dating, your job, your career, your, your individual goals in life, everything, everything has to then be changed and reverted towards Christ in this vocation. What was that experience like? Yeah, first quitting dating, that was a very hard decision. And then also quitting my job. I mean, I, I was not a, a very late vocation. It was at the age of 21 when I experienced that call. So it was not that late, but still, you know, to cut all, uh, uh, cut all the, <clears throat> uh, uh, the, the relationships and also at home, you know, I feared my parents would be against, of course, my mother. She always prayed I would be a priest, but <laughs> then when she heard I want to become a priest and go far away, maybe to Brazil, then 
uh, things also changed for her. But she was never against it. She said, if God calls, we have to follow. Yeah. Yeah, so it, that was another question of mine is, you know, support structures and, and family, right? So did you have, did you have, aside from your mother, people who were kind of in your corner saying, yes, you know, we, we support you, we're praying for you, we think this is, uh, we agree, you know, we think that you should be a priest? I must say I was very quiet about it. And um, um, I had then a lot of contact with the priest of the All of Ken Circle of the Holy Cross. And uh, in order to discuss further things, I simply, you know, um, called them or wrote them a letter and so on. So, but uh, besides that, um, I didn't go. I didn't. I didn't go anywhere else. So just to the priest of our order. And, and you, you know, you mentioned earlier that one of the big, you know, uh, identifiers for you for this particular order was their uh, how they lived out their priesthood. So now I'm thinking, okay, you had this ex expectation, this revelation, and what you've seen, but now you've been in it for 20 years. Uh, what has then that been like for you? Has that been edifying? Is that you know confirming everything about this community? and how they live out the priesthood is that something now you have more insight because you're part of the community now and you're living out a priesthood the way that you saw when you were younger yeah there's always a development and you always grow in your vocation so there's always something new something you didn't know before and you need continue to say yes 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 uh there's some factors they always stay the same you know it's a religious vocation your priesthood celebrating mass and these things uh, but there are always new factors that are coming in you get a new mission you get a new assignment and they can even change superiors uh, then uh, at that time also we still were going through the last stage of getting our uh, constitution constitutions finally approved then our uh, our postulate, the Opus Sanctorum and Shalom, uh, was also only approved in 2007 uh, by the Holy See. So there are always new steps, and uh, even in religious orders, uh, they can things things can always change to a certain extent. And you you need, you need to grow with it. Give always your fiat like the Blessed Mother to every stage. The Blessed Mother also didn't know from the beginning uh, all the different things she would go through through her life. The first was the incarnation or the Annunciation. She said yes, but she didn't know how it actually would develop. And the next thing was the angel um, promised her this, um, uh, she would be the mother of God. Uh, he would rule over the house of David. His king would have no end. And the next thing is she gives birth in a stable she has to flee to egypt so you need faith in this vocation uh, you need allow god to surprise you with things you never thought of before to even disappoint you so and that is this unconditional yes and you can only give that when you have faith and this total trust in God. But even this in faith and trust, you always need to grow. And each time you give your yes to God in a very difficult moment, it energizes you, you grow, and uh, you can trust more. You become more the person God wants you to be, more the priest God wants you to be. But in this sense, development in vocation never ends. It goes on until the end of life. I love uh, that that little part about Mary finding out about this. Of course, she not only found out she was going to bear the the Son of God, but also she was told she was her heart was going to be pierced with a, a sword of sorrow, and so she knew that there was a daunting task at, ahead. And she still said said yes. She still kept going, and she still lived that out so that we can see uh, how we're supposed to live our life and orient ourselves towards Christ. And of course, 
this really is a great transition for our topic about, uh, you know, participating in the passion of our, of our Lord, like Mary did. And of course, we're talking about repar- uh, reparation and expiation. So you said uh, before, before we uh, started the show that you think this is something in particular that religious need to, to live out and understand a lot more. Uh, why is that? What, what is the core of this and, and why is it so important? It is not only religious, but the entire church. And right now, uh, my perception of the whole of the entire church is that we are kind of free fall right now. The culture gets stronger. You know, the 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 the, the, uh, the difficulties for the church, and um, we are more and more uh, the church. Generally speaking, we become more and more worldly you now, and. Uh, church attendance goes back and all these things. And it seems now the world right now is swallow up the Catholic world, you know, especially in Europe, in the United States, I'm right now in Austria here. And it's just sad, you know, uh, we have some Brazilians here also in the monastery right now. And in Brazil, the faith is somehow still very passionate, very enthusiastic and, uh, Now, when they are here, they said, it's so sad here in Austria, in Germany, because it's it's really people don't go to church and they don't believe. And uh, so why is this? Um, And I think what we forgot in the church the past 40, 50 years is uh, that we are all called to participate in Christ's passion, that we are all called uh, to also do expiation and reparation for the, our own sins and the sins of the world. And that is our very most powerful gift we have in the church. But not only in practice is this denied the past 40, 50 years, but even in theory, it is rejected by many theologians, by bishops and priests, the, uh, uh, the, the practice of expiation. But it's all biblical. It's all biblical. It's in church documents. And this is really the weapon, the most powerful weapon the church has. And right now, it seems to me, we try to use means of the world in order to uh, overcome certain difficulties, but it will never work. The world is so much smarter than we are. Simply means diplomacy or adapting ourselves to the state guys, to the spirit of the world, we will just drown more and more. We will be swallowed up by the world. But our Lord said we need to overcome evil in the world. We need to overcome the world. And it is with his weapons. And his most powerful weapon was that he came into the world as a man, became man. It was the a very profound condescension, emptying of himself. And he can even a more emptying in his passion on the cross. And then the third emptying and condescension, that is the Eucharist. And everything is really connected to expiation, reparation. And that is the only way we can overcome evil. How did Christ overcome evil? Not by debating with adapting uh, to the, to the things, uh, uh, to the, uh, to the, to the opinions of the world, but by his passion and cross, he overcame evil. And it is also our way now, mystical body, uh, we have now to follow in the footsteps of our law in order to overcome the evil. It wasn't in all centuries when the church was strong, it was always because the church knew how to suffer well. It knew the meaning of suffering and to do it out of love, and then we could actually overcome evil in the world. And it's the only way we can conquer the world and save souls. I, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up how to suffer well, because that's, that's at the core of this. I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, our natural inclination is to avoid suffering. And yet right. we have this beautiful suffering that we get to enjoy ourselves in. And that is, a, that is a big obstacle for people. And not only do we call that suffering an obligation, but we call it a privilege. 
And we and even going Absolutely. even going further than that, we've heard the saints talk about you know uh, the fall of man. They call it oh happy fault. They they are so in, in a way happy that there was this fall because it, because it gave us uh, Jesus Christ, which we would not have had otherwise. And so it's an opportunity and a privilege, but we can't see past that obstacle. So how how do we get culture? How do we get people to understand this? this privilege of suffering with Christ? I would say uh, looking at the life of the saints, but also um, when we look back to Fatima, for over 100 years, uh, Portugal was dominated by Freemasonry that tried to eliminate religious life in the, in the country. For example, our order was extinguished in 1834. In Portugal. So several or the most uh, religious orders were simply forbidden. Their uh, property was confiscated and they were simply dissolved, all the orders in Portugal. In 1910, uh, this got even worse. The other Freemasons, they now established a republic and now they even exiled the bishops, the good bishops of the country. So this is the state of Portugal before the, uh, the Blessed Mother appears in 1917 and one they had 22 uh, presidents uh, within about, I think, 12 years. So it was all very unstable in, in, in Portugal. And one said in one year, there will not be a single Catholic in Portugal anymore. And then in 1917, Our Lady appeared. What did she say? She didn't say anything about uh, um she didn't complain about politics, culture, and so on. The only thing she said, pray, sacrifice, and the third was communal preparation. And it's the only thing the children did. They prayed, they sacrificed, they did adoration. And um, because the children then collaborated so well, the people saw it. And there came more and more people to Fatima in the, on the October 13th, there were 70,000. And then there was this movement of Fatima and the bishops collaborated at that time. They were now somehow purified through the persecution. They all suffered there. And now everybody took really the Fatima message to heart. Within 10 years, this country was completely changed. And then uh, on the... 25th anniversary of the first apparition that was May 13th, 1942, uh, the bishops, they made a statement. They said, if somebody would have closed his eyes 25 years ago and opened it now, he wouldn't have recognized what, is, what was happening here in Portugal. And we know only one word that can describe this change. Miracle. So again, how was it done? By prayer and sacrifice, expiratory sacrifice, out of love for God, because suffering love is the greatest love. And through suffering love, we can overcome evil, not just in putting in the corner and leaving rot there, but evil can actually be overcome like Jesus. He overcame the devil and he overcame all the evil in the world through his passion on the cross. So we, we uh, like to think of things as, you know, kind of having control. That's what we, as humans, we like to have control. And, and part of this process, right, of enjoining ourselves and actively participating in Christ's passion, we, we automatically want to think, hey, we have to do something or, or there's some of this is on us. But in a sense, there's a, what we really have to do is relinquish ourselves and, and right. succumb and become vulnerable. And again, this is something that our culture is not very good at doing, to just relinquish our own uh, and ideas and give our entire selves to Christ. And, and we see that that's important. Obviously, you've done that in, in your personal life and relinquished yourself to, to the Lord's call for you. But what are some ways that we can get people to understand that? And obviously, the miracles in Fatima are awesome, but how can we start to move the needle in the culture so that people can become uh, vulnerable and relinquish themselves to our Lord Jesus Christ and his passion? Uh, 
a key role have always the pastors and the bishops. So they are the teachers of the people. And we need, first of all, renewal of the priesthood. Also, this includes episcopacy. And people, they will not learn it simply from watching television or by themselves. Of course, a lot of people they are devoted and uh, they have good books and so on. They learn it from books. But the sad thing is uh, it's very hard or very seldom that you can actually learn it uh, from priests and bishops. No? This is simply not on the top of their, of their priorities anymore to preach this kind of spirituality. But in general, uh, what we need to do is to live our lives according to the state of life the best we can. So in married life, that they know what is marriage really? What is to have a family? No? Uh, why do we have a children? No? Children are, first of all, destined towards eternity, towards God. They are God's children. That they know the state of my life and also the duties of my life. And then I live them out as best I can. And always out of love of God that I receive the sacraments with devotion, the Eucharist, pray daily the rosary, and really put God always first in my life nah? and always asking him, God, what do you want me to do today? When we always ask God, what do you want me to do today? Then we will get the inspiration and we will get the light and God will lead us through. And then he will yeah, lead us in our lives and that we can grow in our uh, Christian life, in our vocation. So uh, to, to kind of wrap this thing up, because I, again, you mentioned that how important it was, not, not just to religious, but everybody in the world. All, but it is important for religious to know and understand this, but then also to live this out, because that is going to be demonstrative to the rest of the world too. In the same way that you talked about priests and bishops, you know, living this out, teaching, doing this thing, we need witnesses and religious life is a key way to to see that is that is that true is that kind of one of the things that you that you meant when you said it's so important for religious to to know and understand this yeah every state in life uh, must uh, be oriented towards god so also family uh, christian family a good christian family will recognize uh, that they really direct uh, the whole family life uh, towards God. So they will speak in the family setting uh, about their faith. They will share experiences and they will build up each other in the faith, will pray together and so on, they will receive the sacraments together. Now in religious life, it is uh, that we completely commit ourselves to a life in Christ. So we renounce uh, a, a personal property, we renounce the right to get married, and uh, we put ourselves under the obedience of a superior. And these are the three evangelical councils, and this simply expresses our total dedication and disponibility for uh, the kingdom of God. And in this sense, we are already a sign in this world, a eschatological, eschatological sign for the world to come. I couldn't agree more. I think that is a wonderful explanation. Uh, Father, as we as we close today, we thank you for your time and, and dedication. We thank you for your yes uh, to God's call. And what, a, what an amazing, miraculous story that was for you, for you and your life. And we hope that uh, more people can, can listen and participate in Christ's passion. And as we close today, would you mind giving uh, myself and the, and the viewers a blessing? Through the intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, you got in angels, all the ancient saints. May the Mother God bless you all, protect you, enlighten you, strengthen you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. God bless you. Bye-bye.